Well, happy Sabbath again. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. I, um, I always look forward to the communion services. I know they're, it's different and different places you go. I know in the Philippines, we always had the most amount of people showed up on communion Sabbath. Um, maybe it's the opposite, some other places. Um, but uh, I always look forward to it. I think it's a special service. Um, I like that we do it once a quarter, not so frequent that it becomes meaningless, but not so rarely that you forget what it means. So before we begin with the little sermon I have prepared, let's, uh, I'd like to just pray one more time. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath. Thank you, Lord, for this building, this church, each one that is here before me, Lord, um, you have asked me to share your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would share it the way you want it shared, that it would be your message, that it would be exactly what each one needs to hear, Lord. Um, you are our creator and the one who continues to recreate us day by day into your image. I pray, Lord, that your word would not return void unto you today, but it would transform hearts, that people would be drawn to you in irresistible ways, and that you would be glorified. Lord, hide me behind your cross as I share from your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I found a little story, and I wanted to do it for the children's story, but I couldn't find the stuff to make it work. Uh, there was a professor one day, he demonstrated to his class uh, an electromagnet. I don't know how to get one of those or where they're at, so he placed like two pounds of nails on the top of a table with the electromagnetic under, uh, magnet underneath, and he would flip on the switch, and all of them come together, and he could make it change shapes and move them around and do all these things as long as that current was running. And as soon as he took the current off, all the nails just fell down, scattered, and would roll off the table in different places. And it, it kind of reminded me that as long as the current of God runs through us, we have unity in God, and He can form us into His shape and image. We need that vital connection every day, don't we? You know, as I have read through and I thought about a lot, I, I love to study the Word of God. And uh, as we get into it, there's certain themes that we find come up over and over again. Have you noticed that? Some things we need a little bit more reminding of, and when it comes to large groups of people, it's amazing how much we all are different. We're different shapes, different sizes, different hair color, eye color, different opinions. And when you get lots of people together, what do we do? We disagree sometimes. Imagine that, and it becomes challenging. Some people like things quiet, some things people like it exciting all the time. Uh, I have my eldest daughter always wants something happening, always excited. Um, others like it really warm, and others like it really cold, and all these differences. And so when we come together, it can be challenging. Paul talked about this issue quite a bit. He was the apostle that was to go and bring in all the Gentiles. Now, that created a big problem. He was bringing them in with Jews, and Jews saw them as unclean, and they didn't really like them. And so, how did they get along? Well, potlucks became problems, and there was all kinds of challenges that they had. If the Gentile touched the food, it was all unclean. And so, Paul had a, a reoccurring theme of, you need to be united in Christ. It was a reoccurring theme over and over. Let me just give you a couple of references. If you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 6. Paul, speaking of this issue, sometimes we call this his one theology. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He's saying, look, we may have a lot of differences, and that's a good thing, by the way. If we were all exactly the same, maybe you'd all be fighting on who gets to preach, or no one would ever get up and preach, because we'd all be the same. God loves and made each of us unique and just the way we are for a reason. 
minus what we've done with sin. He never intended that part. He wants us to come together and be unified, not just together. I, I've heard a sermon or two where it seems like we all just come together and be happy, set aside anything that's different. Well, that's not exactly what I think Paul was trying to say. He says we need to stand firm in the truth, but unite in Christ. Not set aside our beliefs for the purpose of unity alone, but unify in what truth is. Unify in the way, the truth, and the life. And He can bring us together. And it's amazing how we can all be from so many different backgrounds, and yet we can all come and love each other, be brothers and sisters in Christ, and help each other. When one is down, we help. When one is up, we all praise God together. In Corinthians, so that was speaking to the church in Ephesus. In Corinthians, speaking to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul takes on a similar topic and goes through, and he gives it, this time, a little bit more practicality. He says, in case you weren't understanding exactly what I mean, let me make it a little more clear. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, I'll start. It says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, this is where it gets a real practical in case we don't understand. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I am not of the body. It is therefore not of the body, question. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the, if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Uh, you know, it's amazing just how perfectly our bodies are made up. Uh, I've, I remember hearing someone talking to the youth saying, it, it's, it's amazing, if God would have just put our nose the other way up, we would have all drowned to death, because all the water came down every time it rains here in Washington. So uh, he made it just the way it needed to be. He continues, and uh, this is verse 20, uh, 19, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our present, presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, and there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these to the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gift. And yet, I show you a more exalted way. In essence, Paul's saying, we're all different and that's great. We need all of you to really function the way the church is supposed to function. Amen. Now, I really meant all of you. I know sometimes we have this rule where 20% do 80% of the work and 80% do no work or 20%. <laughs> Many times we need more people. We have all been called with a purpose. You know, as we go through life, everyone is looking to answer questions. One of the most common questions people ask is, what am I here for? What are you here for? Why are you here this morning? Are you worship, here to worship God? I hope that's what church is all about. Amen. Hoping to hear from God? I hope that's true as well. Amen. But God also has a purpose for each of our lives. He has something He wants you to do for Him. And I don't know what that is exactly, but God wants to use each and every person. 
He didn't call just a few of us to do everything. He called all of us to do a little bit, the part we're meant to do. You know, I think Paul took this idea of this oneness. It wasn't unique to him. It wasn't something that Paul came up with just because he started running into trouble. And I'm not preaching this because there's trouble. It's just because we need to be one. One in Christ. It was Jesus' longing prayer. You know, if you turn to John with me, John chapter 17. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, is recorded the longest prayer of Jesus that we're aware of. And in this prayer, Jesus prays essentially for three things. And one of the most critical points of this is when He prays for us. In the first five verses, He prays for Himself. Uh, this is John 17, 1 through 5. In verse 4, He says, I have glorified you, speaking to the Father, on earth, and I have finished the work which you have given me to do, because right after this, He goes to Gethsemane. And now, O Father, glorify me together with Yourself. He's praying for Himself that He would give glory to God. A good thing we should all do and pray that God would be glorified in our own lives. But then he continues on and he prays for his disciples, those who he was so close to. He'd spent three and a half years, his full ministerial life was really focused on 12 people. And these people were not perfect people. Amen? They had all kinds of problems, just like us. They didn't have all their theology right. They were ready to call down fire from heaven. They fought amongst themselves. They were trying to seek the greatest position. They had problems. In fact, right after this, he just told two of them that they're going to betray him. Peter betrayed him three times, and Judas went off and truly betrayed him unto death. He knew they were betraying him. He knew what was going on, yet he pours out his heart to God for them. You know, there's a lot of power in praying for an enemy. Not the easiest thing to do. Not something we like to do. We call them enemies for a reason, right? That means we don't really often like them very much, but we need to pray for them. He goes through and he says, all of mine are yours. Yours are mine. These are our children. This is our church family. And he goes on as he's praying for them. Verse 15, it says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We need to be in the word of God to be sanctified and be transformed into his image. If our only spiritual meat is here at church, we will find ourselves struggling and lacking during the week. But one of my favorite parts of all is when you get down to verse 20. Jesus, knowing his disciples weren't perfect, but praying for them, he knew when they got this all figured out, when they really got right with God, when the Spirit was poured out on them, there was going to be a great harvest. You know, the same is true for us. When we get right with God, he's going to pour out his Spirit and there's going to be a great harvest like there has never been. So he prays for the ones that would come through the harvest. That's you and I, friends. Amen. Starting in verse 20, it says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, I want you to notice the key point when Jesus prays for us. What is his main thing he's praying for as we read through this? That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, when we are unified in Christ, it's a testimony to the whole world of who Jesus is. He continues, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. He gives us the power of the Spirit, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, in unity. I find it amazing that he says, you know, there's a perfection, there's a beauty, unparalleled except for in Christ, when the people of God come together in unity. When we all work together, when we do our part, when we love the way Christ loved, when we are unified in Him, beautiful and amazing things happen. 
And often the problem is when we're not seeing that as we're not really as unified as we should be. He says, and that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. He says, I want to see every single one of these people in the kingdom. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done. I don't care if they're Jew. I don't care if they're Gentile. I don't care if they're heathen. I don't care what they have done. I'm dying so every one of them can be there. It's a free gift of salvation. And I want everyone to be there. And that happens best when we're submitted to Him. He says, That they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Notice he doesn't say they know you. He says they know that you sent me. But they still don't have their picture quite right. And I have declared to them your name. That is his character. We tell of the character of God when we live a Christ-like life. And they will declare it. And the love which you loved may be in them and I in them. You see, Jesus is painting a picture. It's kind of like the vine and the branches and all these illustrations he's giving. There's two main things here. It's We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. Someone asked me, well, what's the difference? Why why does it have to be both ways? Well, here's my take on that, and this is my take. This is not straight from Scripture per se, but from my collective study of it. I believe we need Christ in us, the hope of glories, as Paul tells it, because it's Christ in us that enables us to do what Christ called us to do. You by yourselves can do nothing. But with Christ, we can do all things. We need Christ in us. If you're trying to keep the law by your own strength, it's a miserable existence. We need Christ in us working in our hearts, changing our hearts, transforming us to His image, and enabling us to do what He's called us to do. But then we also need to be hid in Christ. You see, I believe when God looks down and we are hid in Christ, we are protected and surrounded by the love of Christ. When He looks down, He doesn't see your sin. He sees Christ when you're hid in Him. And He smiles. This is my beloved son, my beloved daughter. In them I am well pleased, just like at the baptism. We hide our lives in Christ. Our lives should be, as Christians, all about Jesus. It should be about a continual surrender to Him, allowing Him to be in us to will and to do His own good pleasure in us. You see, the problem with that is we kind of have our own will and our own pleasure that we kind of want to do, and that's got to die to let Christ reign. This is what God wanted. This is what Jesus' prayer was, that we would come into union, communion with Him. That's really what it was all about. In fact, when he first told his disciples that they were literally going to eat the bread, drink the juice, described it as his own flesh and blood, a bunch of them left. They said, that's too much. But really, we need Christ in us. Your bread and your drink are what builds your actual body. We need to be built up in Christ. We need to be eating, hungering, and thirsting after righteousness. Hungering and thirsting after God that we become filled. When we do that, we become more and more like Him. He becomes a part of us. I believe the communion service is designed in such a way that we get the opportunity to set aside all our differences. We forgive each other any differences, any challenges that may exist between us and the diversity among us as church members. We get to do that in the foot washing. Yes, it's humbling. We call it the ordinance of humility. First time I watched it, I thought that was the strangest thing I'd ever seen. Hundreds of people washing each other's feet. But when we do it, we show we can get down and bend that knee, humble ourselves, and become a little bit more like Christ. Christ came not to be served, but to serve. That's what we should be about. And in that, it's this 
It's a special bonding time, I believe. When we have that foot washing service, it shouldn't be something done where we talk about everything under the sun and what's going on and how the weather is, but it should be a time of bonding, a time of forgiveness. And uh, I find it interesting just how different this is. If, if you were to go to Romania, we have uh, some friends over in that area, and when they know there's a difference amongst the members in the church, they can't start the communion emblems until they know everybody's made it right with each other. A friend of ours that was a pastor, one of my professors for a while, he said, yeah, there was one time we sat there till about 7 or 8 p.m. waiting for two brothers to get right. And I thought, okay, that's not going to fly in my churches probably, but uh, they took it serious, and that's the point. They made sure they were right because Jesus says, if you want to give something to me, wait. Go make it right if you got something wrong with your brother first, and then come to me. It's very important we do that. When we cleanse our souls of any, any ill will we may have, you know, when we hold on to those things, it really doesn't hurt the other person, but it really destroys your own spirituality, destroys your own peace. So we symbolically wash away all resentment and all wrong feelings towards each other when we humble ourselves before each other and wash their feet. And I believe it's that service, like a little mini baptism, that prepares us to take the emblems. It's that cleansing of the heart through the foot washing and symbolically the whole body, as Jesus put it, with the washing of the feet that prepares us to have a clean vessel that's worthy of the emblems of Christ. And this is why Paul, over and over, he summarizes this way, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17 says this, it says, the cup of blessing which we bless, speaking of communion, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. You see, it's a process of coming together in unity when we take of the bread symbolizing unity in Christ. Again, in Colossians 1.27, he talks about it being Christ in us, the hope of glory. When we partake of those things, we have a little bit of a picture of what it means to have Christ in our lives. So we practice open communion here. Everyone is welcome, and we're going to dismiss at this time. We have a room for the ladies over here, the first one closest to the sanctuary, men behind it, families over in the building next door. No one is required to do this. You can sit, you can watch, you can stay here. There'll be music playing. But I, I just want to challenge you to really cleanse the sanctuary of your heart. Prepare yourself to, for Christ to dwell in you fully and completely. Because when we're right with Him and right with each other, amazing things happen. Let's dismiss for the foot washing. And we'll come back here afterwards. It's always good to come back from the foot washing, for we know we're all clean now. I'm just so thankful for what Jesus does, because it's not about what we do. It's not about any of that. It's really about Him transforming the heart in ways we have no power over. And uh, I just can't praise God enough for what He does in our lives. Uh, when we're looking for change, He changes it always for the better. Maybe through a trial, but it always comes out good on the other side. And so I'm just here to praise and thank Jesus for the salvation we have in Him. And look forward to that day when we get to spend eternity with Him and eat communion with Him. And uh, really just spend eternity with Him as He so longed for us to do. At this time, Sam's going to share a little bit about the bread. Bread is mentioned 326 times approximately in the Bible. And in most of those cases, it refers to food in general, not just what we call bread. Uh, food or bread is basic to life. It nourishes us, satisfies our hunger, and gives enjoyment to our taste buds. Jesus calls himself the bread of life. He gives us spiritual life. 
that heals us from the ravages of sin. When we come to him, he transforms our lives and satisfies the emptiness that troubles each of us when we are apart from him. Knowing Jesus is the sweet savor of peace and happiness and hope for an amazing future. He paid the ultimate price to demonstrate that we can trust him. As you eat the bread that represents Christ's body broken in the sacrifice for you, remember how much he loves you. Remember, he wants you to be renewed in the likeness of God and reunited with him for eternity. Now, I just want to make a quick announcement about the bread. We do have a gluten-free option, and if you would, once I've said the prayer, you raise your hand, we will have one of our um, deacons serve you with the gluten-free bread. Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, you sacrificed so much that we can't even imagine. You humbled yourself coming down from heaven. You served us on this earth to show us what God is really like. And then at the end, you gave your life so that we might have eternal life. And now as we partake of this bread, we ask that you will help us not to forget the mighty gift that you've given to us, but that each moment of every day, you, your uh, life will shine through us, your spirit will be in us, so that we can live upright lives that will bring glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. As they uh, pass those out, it looks like we have gluten-free in all of them. So uh, you don't need to raise your hand. The little one in the middle is gluten-free. And we do want to allow a time for testimony. Sometimes through these special times when we're here together, a little testimony and praise uh, is wonderful to share. As mentioned, you know, when we all hurt, we all hurt. And uh, when, we, when one rejoices, we should all rejoice. So we want to Pass around the mic if someone would like to share a little bit of praise on what God's done in their life lately. Well, many of you know already, but um, we just have to give praise to God because... Josh and Oksana gave birth to their baby last Sabbath, Sabbath afternoon, and he is a beautiful baby boy, very healthy, and uh, his name is Jordan Alexander. Praise God. I am thankful for our new pastor. When our pastor Steve came and he said he was leaving, I was just sure what pastor we going to have. We could not ask for a better pastor than we have now. Thank you for being here. One week ago, I was praising the Lord in UCA, and very happy because uh, the Lord allowed Danny to finish his high school.
My name is Michael Gill, and um, me and my wife, we come from the Highline Church up in um, Des Moines, Washington. And um, in the process of trying to move up here to try to find some um, peace and quiet so I could spend more time um, in my Bible and working on, instead of working on cars and running to everybody's um, needs, um, we became homeless um, for the last week. And it's really been a trying time for me because I'm not used to anything like this. But um, the good part is that even though it took me two weeks to load and unload my truck twice, a 26-footer, that he still allowed me to get done with it with my wife's help and allowed me to be here on the Sabbath to um, get to know the new church that I'm going to be coming to. And so I just want to praise him for bringing me through this and my wife through this because I think about a week ago, um, or actually in the middle of my moving, I was listening to a sermon on um, on a station at 91.7. It's an excellent station to listen to if you want to really listen to Christian hymns and um, just listen to the word of God being preached. But um, it talked about smiling and being loving and caring and happy as you go through a trying time. We can all do this in sunshine when it's nice out, when the sun's bright, when we're warm, when we're having fun. But how can, but can you do that when you're going through a troubled time? Well, yeah, we can. We just have to keep our minds and our hearts fixed on God. That's it. So praise God. And don't worry, if you didn't get a chance to share, you can share on the next round. I'd like to just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Next, we have the wine, or the juice, as we often call it. And when we think about that, it's, it's representing the blood of Christ. And of course, when we think of the blood of Christ, we think of the great sacrifice and the suffering he went through. The death that Christ died was a traitor's death. The death of an enemy of the state. But if you think about it, who are really the traitors? Who are really the enemies of the state? It's, it's us. We are the enemies of God's government. And yet he came and he died for us that we might have entrance into his kingdom. What an amazing sacrifice he made. And in Leviticus 17.11 it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you, upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Christ's life is in the blood. And as we take this, we are symbolizing taking Christ's life, not just over us to cover our sins, but into us, to cleanse us from the inside out. As uh, Romans 6 verse 11 says, Likewise, 
reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, that we might walk in newness of life. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord's blessing. Dear Father in heaven, we need you in us. We need you in and throughout us. And Lord, what a great sacrifice you made to make that possible. Help us to be fully aware that we might be fully alive, electrified, as uh, Pastor uh, mentioned, by your spirit in us, working through us and in us, that we might serve you day by day, day in and day out, we pray. Once again, we want to just open up if someone would still like to share um, about what God has been doing in their life. I just want to say thank you to God because I spend many hours on the freeway each week, and I'm just thankful that he's protected me over all these years, and I'm just thrilled that I know that the angels are with me each time I go. I also want to testify the Lord has helped me through this week. Had a very tough job at, at work uh, replacing a 300 pound fan motor on the top of a cart washer eight feet in the air and it was my prayer that we would do that safely and we did accomplish that and not only that one little benefit along the way. I had some wood, and I took the wood to lay across the top, and it was the right length. And I was just praising the Lord that we had what we needed. But I thank him so much for his care and love for each of us, and especially the sacrifice that he has made that we commemorate today. Someone else? I live over in Shelton now, and uh, last night about 6.15, all of a sudden our power went out. And I was saying, oh, well, you know, with the power going out, you're so used to electricity, and uh, you can't hardly even read in the dark, you know. You get, a, you get your candles out and whatnot. But anyway, I was saying, well, we'll probably be in for a, a long night without uh, power. And I was kind of resigning to it, but then all of a sudden I realized I started thinking about my neighbors. I said, well, I got it made here. I'm all right. But what about my neighbors? Are they all right? How are they doing? So I said a short, quick prayer to the Lord. Lord, bless my neighbors and keep them safe in this time. And no sooner did I do that than the refrigerator went back on and we got power back on. And I knew it was from the Lord. He just answered my prayer when I started thinking about somebody else besides myself. So praise God. He's a faithful God. Amen. It's the time of year for schools to be getting out. And uh, as a teacher, it's a kind of bittersweet. I'm ready for summer break. But I have been... So blessed this year with a great group of kids, and it's going to be sad to see them go. But um, I also just want to say thank you to the Lord for giving me the opportunity to work with young people because they, they drive you crazy, but you love them, and, and you feel, I just feel like I'm still a young person 
because of that. So thank you, Lord. I guess I know I usually have the mic, but um, I'd like to say just thank you to God for us getting into our new home, and we're pretty much all unpacked except for our garage in a week, um, which is a miracle. Um, if any of you have ever moved, you know. So um, I'm just very thankful for a new place where I can look out my windows and see wildlife and creation, and it's just a, a beautiful thing um, seeing the little baby birds and tree house, little trees, and uh, just I'm just so blessed by God for the church family, for the house I have, for everything I have. I'm just so thankful for God. I just want to uh, praise God for those families who have helped the school so far and praise God for those families who are still going to help the school. <laughs> well, in the few weeks that we've done it so far, we've already raised almost $900 for the school already. So uh, continue to think of what you have at home to give to the school and so that uh, God can richly bless our community as well as our kids. Thank God for the great day that we are all together here. And uh, I'd, I'd like to tell you that uh, my granddaughter, who is on the way from home, which is at night now there, is coming over for mission program. She will be arriving in New York tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Please remember her on prayer. After the program, after six or four to six months, she will be over here. Definitely you will see her. I also want to thank God for everything that he has done for us. And, and my son, Kevin, our son, Kevin, is here with us today. <laughs> thank you. I look around and think what a blessing you all are. It's wonderful to be here worshiping with you and to be here. Uh, I think back on when Summer and I came number of years back and um, how uh, we've both grown and it's been wonderful uh, growing with you. And I think also looking over here and seeing Dick and, and my friend Richard sitting next to each other, both here because of their conviction on the Sabbath. And I just praise God uh, uh, for what he does in our hearts day in and day out. Continuing to read. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And I always like to end with the last verse here. For as often as you eat this bread... And drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. In other words, we proclaim we have victory because of Christ's death. So praise God for Jesus. Let's stand and we're going to sing our closing hymn, Spirit of the Living God, page 672.